Pursuant to the Massachusetts Open Meeting Law, General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 20, notice is hereby given of a meeting of the Horse Racing Committee. Given the unprecedented circumstances resulting from the global coronavirus pandemic, Governor Baker issued an order providing limited relief from certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law to protect the health, safety of individuals interested in attending meetings, public meetings. In keeping with the guidance provided, the committee will conduct this public meeting utilizing remote collaboration technology. Any and all votes taken at this meeting will be done by a roll call vote. Uh, with that, I'll call the meeting to order and I'll call upon each of the members of the committee to introduce themselves and note their designation to the committee. And I'll start with Commissioner Cameron. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am present for the meeting. Uh, Gail Cameron representing the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. And Attorney Katonic. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily Katonic. I am the treasurer's representative. And Mr. Umbrello. Good morning, everyone. Paul Umbrello representing the thoroughbred industry. And Attorney Goldberg. Yes, good morning, everyone. Mr. Chairman, Peter Goldberg, representing the HHA and &E and SOM, the representatives of the Standard Red Industry in Massachusetts. Thank you. And I'm Brian Fitzgerald, the chair and governor's designee. So thank you all to everyone for attending this meeting. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes of our meeting of February 17th, 2021. Uh, I know that the minutes were submitted as a uh, pre-read for all of the committee members. And I'd ask if uh, the members have had an opportunity to review those minutes and if they have any comments uh, or changes or corrections to be made to the minutes. Uh, Mr. Chair, I did have a chance to review them and I found them to be in order. I'm happy to make a motion if if everyone else agrees. Sure, I'd ask for a motion to approve the minutes with any clerical mistakes to be made. Uh, move the meetings from our previous uh, meeting, which was on February 17th. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all right. And the motion carries, so then we will take a uh, roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Attorney Katana. Aye. Mr. Umbrello. Aye. Attorney Goldberg. Yes. And Fitzgerald, aye. Okay, all right. Thank you. Uh, the third item on our agenda is the review of the uh, Racehorse Development Fund revenue. Uh, I would ask um, Attorney Grossman if you would be so kind to share a few pages of the revenue just so the members and the public can see. So what I did was just selected a few of the pages, just the relevant pages from the uh, report that is issued uh, monthly by the Gaming Commission. Um, I'd ask if you could just scroll down to page two. So you can see there where you scroll back up a little bit. Page two, sorry. Mm. Oh yeah. So there you can see the allocation, the uh, total allocation over the inception of the uh, fund has been just over 92 million. Uh, the amount mm -hmm. that's been paid out is uh, just over 73 million and the balance in the fund is just over is $19,422,000. Okay. Um, any questions regarding that? Um, okay. And then I just wanted to note um, 
which it turns out it's pages 13 and 14, but I have it as page three and four, just to see what's reported between the current split of the fund between the thoroughbred industries and the standard bread industry. Um, if you scroll down, you can see taking into account the amount when the um, last change was made with respect to the split and the distributions that have been made to each of the industries are noted there. One of the things I did note was I just kind of went through the figures and just did my own calculations just to do a simple comparison, which was in February of 2020, last year, pre-pandemic, uh, the monthly collection was uh, 1.517 million. February 2021 was showing uh, 1.223 million um, that's collected between the three licensees, which designates or shows a 19% uh, decrease. So hopefully uh, things are going to move forward. And obviously, as you know, um, last year, half of March through June, there were no collections. So it's hopeful that with everything moving forward through the vaccine rollout, um, that uh, these numbers will uh, start to increase as life somewhat returns to normal. So. Does anyone have any other questions regarding the revenue update? Okay. All right. Okay. So we'll move on to the next item on our agenda which is item number four, review and discussion of present racehorse development fund distribution percentages, purses, breeding, health and welfare, and consideration of adjusting the recommendations based upon discussions between the thoroughbred and standard bred industries. As the members of the committee will recall at our last meeting on February 17th, uh, we were presented with a proposal from both industries um, and I believe we agreed that we would need some more information and requested that the industries either submit a joint memorandum or memorandum kind of explaining their proposal based on the figures of the uh, 2020 racing season. So I would note that um, Two memorandums were submitted by, uh, one memorandum was submitted by the uh, thoroughbreds and one memorandum was submitted by the standard breads. Uh, in terms of process, I guess what I do is uh, probably, uh, I guess I would uh, call upon Mr. Umbrello at this time to just kind of talk about the thoroughbred industry and um, the process that you went through with respect to uh, this proposal and also as to why you feel this proposal is based in the best interest of your industry. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, may I make one request before we get into the specific proposals? In reading through the various documents that we received in preparation for these meetings, you just mentioned two of them. There are also two additional uh, documents submitted that, that were made available to the committee. Um, the role of this committee has been mentioned in, I think, three of the four documents. What we should be doing, can be doing. If you don't mind, for my edification and maybe everyone else's, I, I'd love to ask Mr. Grossman just to uh, review the statutory role of this, uh, this committee, because in the documents there were things mentioned that I don't believe are uh, part of our um, we don't have the authority to, to, to handle such matters. But I would, if you don't mind uh, just taking okay. a minute for Mr. Grossman to just review that and then we can get into the specifics. Sure. That'd Thank you fine. very much. That'd be fine. Okay. I'm sorry to put Mr. Grossman on the spot, but he's, he's accustomed to that by now. Oh, my pleasure, Commissioner Cameron and Mr. Chair and members, if I may. Good morning to everybody, uh, first of all. Uh, secondly, happy to, to walk through the committee's um, authority here. As we all know, the 
horse racing committee um, was established by way of general law chapter 23k section 60 which is the same statute that created the racehorse development fund and the committee uh, was established for a very narrow reason and it has a very narrow focus um, as well and that is to make recommendations as to how funds from the racehorse development fund will be distributed between the breeds that's the very simple and limited um, um, focus of the racehorse committee. The committee, of course, is comprised of five members who are all appointed uh, by different authorities. Um, each comes with your own areas of expertise and backgrounds and experiences. And each of the five members is on equal footing. Uh, no one member has any more authority than any other. Uh, no member, one member's opinion about anything carries any more weight than any other members. Um, of course, um, when it comes to the, and this is kind of getting a little bit into some of the comments without me opining as to what the person or people said or, or didn't say, but um, the implication was that that um, if the industry representatives come to an agreement that that uh, has to be followed. Um, and I'll certainly leave it to the committee as to whether that is the case or not, but there's no legal requirement that any agreement between any two members be followed by the rest of the committee. Um, certainly to the extent that any particular members have opinions about things, it might be considered more persuasive or very highly persuasive uh, to the others, um, if certain members agree on certain things, but that's basically the extent um, of it. And otherwise, nobody's opinion has to be followed or, or what have you. Of course, everyone's opinion should be considered. Um, and uh, that's basically what the statute talks about. Of course, there are other um, considerations that should go into the uh, ultimate recommendations and those are described in the, the statute and I'm sure you're about to get into all those so I, I wasn't going to go through any of that although we can do that too those are spelled out in section 60 as well so I think that's the fairly well understood overview of how this committee was comprised and its specific authority of course the recommendations that this committee makes then go before the gaming commission that has to essentially um, vote to adopt the recommendations. And that's how the distribution percentages or splits, as they've come to be called, uh, come into effect. If the committee takes no action or the commission takes no action, the, the split figures would remain as they presently are. Um, so that's what's on the table here today is the question as to whether the committee wants to adjust the recommendation and bring that before the commission. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Grossman. Are there any questions? Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So then uh, I guess we'll take a few minutes and have uh, Mr. Umbrello um, present the summary of the uh, thoroughbreds uh, position at this time. Uh, one thing I would note, Mr. Umbrello, is um, when you're um, describing uh, the proposal and the process that you went through, uh, there was a note in the memorandum that was stated it, in reaching our split position with regard to standard breads, we have consulted both boards of the NEHBPA, the Mass Breeders Association, and have their consent to proceed. So I just wondered if as part of your discussion, you could elaborate on that and what went into that as well. So, thank you. Sure, thank you, Chairman Fitzgerald, members of the committee. Um, <clears throat> yep, so I'll discuss that. So just you know, a, a couple of things real quick before I start, just that I was appointed by both boards to speak on behalf of the NEHBPA and the Mass Thoroughbred Breeders Association the two um, organizations that are recognized today in 23K and both in 128 A and C. Um, and there is no, and I know there was comments about these backdoor deals with, with the standard breads. Um, 
I was also sitting here because time was of the essence as an interim position on this committee because of legal fees were um, exuberant amounts that it's cost us in the past. Um, so it's also why I, I was more or less elected or appointed to serve on this committee as well. Um, now, as far as regarding the splits and how I, I, I or we came to those um, percentages, um, just that I did in fact have a board meeting with the members of the NEHBPA board, discussed the positions and by this committee now, um, rightfully so with the help of, of Council um, Grosser and us breaking out the splits into each program um, actually made it, I would say, more beneficial for each of those um, programs um, to potentially, you know, benefit by us splitting them out. Um, and I'll, I'll elaborate that on that a little more in a second. Um, so what I ended up doing is met with the NEHBPA board, discussed our position for each bucket where we stood with the split, the revenue coming in for purses, the revenue coming in on the breeders bucket and the revenue coming in on the health and welfare bucket. And, and looking at the COVID numbers, um, you know, and obviously, as you stated earlier, how significantly they've been reduced and hopefully looking at what 2021 might look at. And we already see signs for January and February while they're better. They're not on target what we used to see in 2019. Um, so in doing so, we went through um, looking at both short-term and the long-term benefits. So I know historically this committee has adjusted the splits when we would present, you know, our 40 page executive summaries. This committee has historically adjusted the split five to 10% in favor of the standard breads. Um, and in doing so, we always go back and look at, and I know 23K, when it was written, my interpretation, and, and we, we discussed this also as a committee about its interpretation, some of the criteria, the following criteria, but we always look back. Now, it also was implied that we'd always be, when this was written, we'd all, we'd all be racing, right? So it, it, it wasn't intentional of the thoroughbreds to stop racing. Unfortunately, we were dealt a bad hand. But that language in my interpretation is, it was just that to, to look back, but more importantly, I think we need to, which we're doing now is, is look forward as well. Um, at the same time, I met with the um, Mass Thoroughbred Breeders Board and um, explained the same situation to them and, and one of the good things, unfortunately, by breaking out the split, um, it gave us the opportunity to take, you know, and adjust the split individually in each bucket. Unfortunately, you know, as I'm sure you'll see in some of the comments, um, and, and I hate to be this kind of calluses to say, you know, someone in the health and welfare bucket who's receiving um, benefits today, an old age assistance check or life insurance, he might not really care about what's in the, the split for the breeder's bucket or purse bucket. And that applies to every single bucket, right? And unfortunately, it, it, it's challenging for myself and both these boards to try to, to look at the numbers, the finances, and again, the short and long-term needs of each bucket. So it wasn't easy because it's just that you're trying to do what's right for both your health and welfare program, your breeding program, and your investors um, for a racetrack. And again, it's where I'm gonna talk about short-term and long-term um, um, benefits. And not just, again, we look back, look at the criteria, we look at numbers and then say, oh, okay, this is how we determine the split. So what, what I'm gonna do um, quickly is I'm gonna kind of rework and go backwards. Um, so under the health and welfare bucket, it's always been for years and years and years, meeting after meeting, my personal opinion is the health and welfare bucket should always be um, a 50-50 split, right? Two different programs, I get it. The standard breads have a program where I call it like the stock market, you know, your 401k. If, if your revenue is up, your rewards are up. Unfortunately for the thoroughbreds, because we've been doing this for 25 years um, and people have been depending on those checks, you know, month after month and other benefits we offer, it, it, it's hard for myself to, or our organization, to hit a reset button and start all over. Um, I'd love to do that. Um, hopefully not if, but when a track is built, we can look at that. But, but it's almost like us saying, let's stop sending people their social security checks and try to come up with a new program. I, I, I'm just not in a position to do that. And, and more importantly, I need that stability. And again, not looking back, but looking forward 
week to week, month to month, year to year when those checks come in, even during COVID, to know that we can have some sense of stability of that revenue so I can continue to offer our members those health and welfare benefits without having to make cuts. And of course, if there is stability, like either breed, more money coming in, I can offer or do more things for, for our members. So I am trying to, and these were discussions as Attorney Goldberg, I'm sure will say year after year after year, we've always heard, try to work together, try to work together, come up with solutions. So again, um, and talking to the different organizations, it is only fair between the two breeds, right? 50-50 split. I think that's something that, you know, um, we should consider for, you know, almost forever, right? Um, depending on, you know, what happens potentially to either breed. But I, I think that the health and welfare should be kind of locked in at a 50-50 split. Um, one of the other, um, which I know we won't vote today on, but one of the other um, um, premises that is that, you know, 2020 really had no racing. 2021 doesn't look like there's any racing. There might be a long shot, 51 shot, pun intended, to race potentially. But most likely, depending on how things go with a racetrack development, we're looking at 2022. So I was also, it's under the premise that, again, in trying to work with the standard breads, these numbers would stay as they are probably for the next two years. And hence, you know, some of that decision of where we came up with these numbers was looking at five to 10% adjustments year after year. That was factored in for, you know, two years for 20 and 21. Now, um, as far as the breeding, you know, program, it was really important. And again, each bucket, everybody has individual, individual needs. And again, short-term health and welfare, I need the money today and I need to budget today and for the future. The breeders bucket, while, you know, if you look at some of the numbers, the number of foals or um, the number of races held, um, I can tell you we need stability again and, and don't really want to see a large flux in that percentage. Because again, based on the revenue streams with COVID coming in and that both breeds bound by that 8% administrative to just keep your doors open, again, makes it very hard for the industry to keep its doors open if we can't even, it can't even cover our administrative costs. Besides the fact that the breeders, um, which is in our executive summary, have a bill, HD 1017N, to literally, um, you know, kickstart the breeding program or working on industry initiatives, just that to get it going. Um, have an accredited breeding program, which as I simply put it, gives opportunities for, you know, a New York bred horse to come into the Commonwealth, stay on a farm, which benefits the farm for six months. And that horse now would become an accredited mass bred. So it's a way to get it more or less of, you know, a, a instant racing population of, of our mass bred horses. And again, not if, but when a track is built, you want your program like any other state to you know, primarily com be comprised of mass bred horses. That's what you wanna see, mass bred races. At the same time, I can tell you that with a lot of this, this chatter about potentially the breeders bill um, and the incentives we're trying to offer to kickstart the program, um, we're already seeing right now, um, which I didn't get time to put into my executive summary, but we're estimating right now we'll have about 14 mass bred foals born this year, probably even higher than that. And that again is, is just folks getting excited about, you know, the return of a racetrack and the breeding program. We talk about, again, you can breed in Massachusetts, preserve the farms, the open space, you know, all the jobs associated with it, but technically you really don't have to race in the Commonwealth. Other states have done that. So it's why that was important to us to also try to protect the revenue stream is based on the current splits and the revenue coming in as a result of COVID to protect as much money possible that's being paid out that we do have that statutory obligation to pay out those incentives to horses that are running out of state. Um, and then the last bucket, which I will talk about, which is more of the long-term effect, you know, the, the purses. Um, and and it, it was clear in my report, and I'm gonna make the request up, right, right off top, the first is we need to escrow the $20 million of that racehorse development fund. I'm going to ask this committee after and how we vote today is to have a, probably another meeting, go back, look at 205, CMR 149. We should be as the industry, the committee that promotes and, and serves this, this industry 
to make a recommendation to the MTC to escrow that 20 million. If we escrow the 20 million, that is more than enough money to have any investor who wants to come and build a racetrack into Massachusetts to help kickstart their program for one to two years. It was part of also the decision of looking at the, the split, the more money, and I heard it year after year, the money grab, the money grab, the money grab, about dumping more money into that thoroughbred bucket just becomes that. It's a carrot we're dangling out there. So I would rather have the industry, the standard breads that can use it now, take advantage of that. But at the same time, the current split today, if, if you guys really don't, and, and I'm more than happy to do it yet again, if you look at the numbers coming in, even during COVID, 10 million, and you start breaking out the numbers, 80%, 8 million, and then you break that down to a 75-25 split, there's not enough money coming in for any racetrack operator to run any type of significant meet, even if it's a 50-day meet, that's going to get enough horses to race, come up and race. In, in the days we raced at Suffolk, you created a natural circuit between Tampa and Suffolk. So in the wintertime, the guys would go to Tampa and they'd come back up the coast and race at Suffolk because the type of horses, the quality of the horses and the, and the purses you were offering um, supported that. But today, you know, to get those guys that are coming up from Tampa that are going to stop at Delaware, um, Maryland or whatnot, which offer excessive amounts of purses, you have to compete with that. Mr. Goldberg has even attested that in the past about to compete in the industry. You have to offer more purses. And for us to, you know, and again, we look back, here we go again about the criteria. Let's build the racetrack. Let's get established, whether it's Stur 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 Sturbridge or Wareham, right? I don't see in, in conversations with industry experts, it would be almost impossible when a track is built to start a 50 or 60 day meet instantly. You're slowly in the mis misnomer. We're only going to run festivals. It's just that it's a misnomer. Misnomer, you would have to start six, 10, 12 day meets for the first couple of years, show folks what the facility and the program is going to look like, and then increase those purses. It's why, again, it's more important for this committee to look and consider it in the Gaming Commission to escrow the 20 million, preserve that money for those investors in Sturbridge and Wareham, assure them that the money will be there. And not the fact that whether if you really break down whether it's, you know, 8% of purses to the thoroughbreds or 20%, the amount is insignificant. It, it's probably close to about a million dollars when you're forecasting. A million dollars in the thoroughbred industry today is about five days of racing. What's more important is, again, I, I can't emphasize escrowing the Racehorse Development Fund. I also ran by both the lobbyists and investors for the Storebridge Group, explained to them that 92 8%. They understood, and, and their whole premise was, and as Mr. Goldberg also knows, is that um, as well is that when we build a racetrack and we start racing, right, and I'm going to come to this committee if we're all still around, we would then look to significantly switch back, fair is fair, that percentage to help the thoroughbred industry, um, you know, preserve its race cards and its number of race days. I also spoke twice to counsel for the um, Wareham folks. And they also understood our, our position with trying to now, because we rightfully broke out each bucket, how we're trying to obviously short-term and long-term support and preserve each one of those you know, buckets, which is very important to both breeds um, in the industry. And, and then in closing, when we, I, I'm going to make one last comment. I have to, I'm sorry, but you know, when we talk about, and it's going to come up about you know, the recognized horsemen's organization in, in the group, again, this committee needs to understand by statute, and <laughs> there is only one group, the NEHBPA and the Mass Thorber Breeders Association. And it should speak volumes if folks don't know it, that with the bills that are currently submitted around um, sports betting, that the NEHBPA is not in one, not in two, but recognized as the horseman's group in six of those bills. So that should speak volume to, to where this organization stands um, within representing the thoroughbred industry. I thank you for your time and I'm, I'm open for questions. Thank you, Mr. Umbrello. Mr. Mr. Chair, do you want questions now or would you want to yeah, sure. proceed with well, both presentations first? Uh, why don't we, if there are questions that the members have at this time for Mr. Umbrello, I, I'd welcome those to be asked at this time. So. Um, I, I do have a question then, thank you. Uh, Mr. Umbrello, thank you. That was very thoughtful. Um, 
discussion and much more information than we had before about uh, the rationale. Um, and and yep. my question, my question is this: um, I guess, I guess um, your organization had a representative last year. It was Mr. Savage who fought yep. so hard and frankly successfully to uh, persuade this uh, committee that um, holding on to more purse money did in fact help those investors who are looking for a, um, to possibly build a new track here in the Commonwealth. So I guess I'm just uh, asking the question as to how your organization now feels differently than you have for years and years and years on um, persuading this committee that that was a really important piece. And, and I, I've read every document and I don't see anything. I, I, and I also just listened to what you said. And I, I just, I'm, I'm, that's my question is how, um, you know, you fought so hard to hang on to some of that money and now um, you think 8% is the right amount of money going to uh, the thoroughbred industry. Yep, I, I thank you, Commissioner Cameron. I, I can and I, I will admit that, you know, uh, part of it was is that we weren't in the middle of a, of a pandemic and with the COVID numbers um, um, coming in and, and how, how, you know, bleak they were and how it was affecting both the breeding and health and welfare program again short term more importantly than the long term with the purses um so as a result of that i looked closer to just that at you know covid brought in about 10 10 million dollars and when you stop breaking that down um i felt and again why i'm pushing more it's more important for the investors in my conversations with the investors escrow the 20 million dollars than worrying about you know, 200, 500,000, uh, most, if you run numbers and look at the breakdown, it's probably about a million dollars based on trying to forecast for 2021. So it was me personally was trying to now to, to, I will admit, switch gears and have this committee understand and push and focus on, and hopefully with the help even of, of council, um, um, Grossman, push to escrow the $20 million. That is far more important um, to the industry to help help an investor know that that money is now in escrow, secured for three years, um, that would assure them that just that. If in the event they started a 50-day meet, like, you know, you, you built a track, you pour water, it's built, and now we can race tomorrow and we're going to run a 50-day meet, you know, again, even at a 75-25 split to put on the program you want, there's just not enough money coming in. It's far more important to escrow that, that money. So that was, that was kind of the, one of the factors. And then as we talked about, I get it during COVID, which again, hopefully there's light at the end of the tunnel where with vaccinations coming out and things seem to be opening up and hopefully it stays that way. Um, you know, we didn't race. In, in, in the past, we fought every every bucket about racing. We raced, we raced, we could show the W2s, the 1099s, the purses, the handles, right? Um, I'm not mm -hmm. going to deny it. But mm -hmm. you, 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 see, you see the right-hand column of the thoroughbreds, right? So, and again, historically, the way the committee has adjusted the split five or 10%, um, and now there's no basis for us to make a case on the on the purse account and by breaking out rightfully so. Um, but that was the other reason why is to, to, to fight that fight. I wasn't sure how much, um, no matter what I made for, or we made for, for a case of it. Um, you know, again, looking at two years, I don't see much to change over the next two years unless something miraculously happens and then, you know, we come back and we revisit this, but that was really kind of the logic behind it. That, you know, we didn't race and rightfully so the, the standard breads are. Um, I hope that answered your question. Yes, yes, sir, it does. Uh, I just have, uh, I guess, two comments. One is, um, I, I think as, as uh, Attorney Grossman uh, pointed out, um, it is not within this committee's authority to uh, to deal with an escrow matter. And secondly, is are you at all concerned when you when you made this decision, knowing how this commission this committee has worked for years? And when I say that, I I think somewhat cautiously um, that recommending 92 percent from 70 and then saying, okay, but now we want the money back uh, when there's a racetrack track built and 
I just wonder, have you considered that, that that may be a more difficult position um, when you allow that much to swing in the other direction? No, because that's what I thought I was kind of, and again, when we were been directed for the last 12 years, as I'm sure Mr. Goldberg, when he gets a chance to speak, we'll talk about, it's just that. It's no reason why this committee, from what we are doing by making a large swing in the purse, is that when we are up and running and it's built, this committee, in fact, should consider the same thing and make another swing in the other direction. I mean, I wouldn't expect us when we're up and running only to do a 5% split. That was also part of the premise behind this is, you know, uh, we're showing good faith short term to help the standard breads today with the purses and that when, not if, but I'll keep saying it, but when that track is built, and the need it's going to be for those that purses and that funding, then this committee and both breeds should sit back down and, and make that swing back significantly. You know, again, we look, I, I keep saying it, we look back at the criteria and we line up W2s, 1099s, purses and all that. It, it really should include the relative needs of each industry in those buckets, right? So like we talked about health and welfare, we have fixed needs that both breeds need to, to um, support breeders. We have statutory obligations we need to support, we're, you know, contrary to the criteria. And the same with that purse bucket. When, when we're up and running, we cannot run a 60-day meet for $50,000 a day. Even the standard breads don't, no disrespect, they, they don't even run for that money. So assumptions are built in this committee, rightfully so, would make the big swing back to the to favor the thoroughbreds. There's no reason why we shouldn't. We're setting a precedent today to do that. I would expect the same in return. That was the logic behind that. Okay, thank you for your response. No, thank you. <laughs> and then if one, one note, I'm sorry, I forgot, you know, and, and to put it in perspective, which I worry about, right? I, I forgot was on the health and welfare. We have, as a result of COVID, um, and I think I've mentioned this before, is we have a $150,000 deficit that, you know, again, um, <laughs> I'm trying to to deal with and struggle without having to make cuts to our program, right? So it's again those short term and and long term solutions and how you put out, you know, again, the different fires that that are that are starting and the predicament we're in. So um, I meant to mention that about the health and welfare and why again that's important for us for stability. Thank you. Attorney Katunuk, did you have any? Any questions for Mr. Umbrello? No, no questions from my end. It was a very helpful overview. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Umbrello, I just had um, just a, a couple of quick things that I just kind of wanted to go over. So I just kind of wanted you to uh, just again um, describe in terms of the process with the consent from the membership. Was there a vote taken at the membership? Were there meetings that were taking place by the board in terms of how they arrived at their consent for this proposal? Um, nope, it, it wasn't a both board that meant it wasn't a vote that either board took. It was just more of a um, agreement by the board members to, to proceed and move forward with um, just that, trying to um, Present present a summary that made sense to protect and again each each individual bucket directly if we want to call it that. So it, it was at a board meeting. It was discussed. No vote was taken. It was just more of a mutual agreement for myself to move forward. Okay. All right. Great. And then um, I guess my my next question is just regarding the the issue of of the the escrow and. Quite honestly, uh, I think I, the question may be more directed to Attorney Grossman to just, or, or Dr. Lightbound to just kind of elaborate that um, these, these funds that are presently there uh, it's essentially are, are purely intended for purse funds for any live races that, that, that take place. Um, correct. Is that? There's a small amount of money uh, in each, in the standard bread and in the thoroughbred that are just was just generally left there. So if yeah. you look at the each month, 
you'll see that besides the um, large amount that's in the thoroughbred um, bucket, if you want to call it that, that there's also, um, you know, uh, a couple of, you know, maybe 20,000 or so in the standard bread bucket. Um, yeah. That was just uh, left there by the commission decided to um, leave some money in the fund originally so that it never got down to zero. Okay. So, but otherwise the, the majority of the fund is what would have been directed towards um, the thoroughbred purse money. The thoroughbred purse money. And it, and it couldn't be used for other purposes within the bounds of the statute, correct? It couldn't That's be correct. allocated for health and welfare benefits or breeding. Okay. Yeah. And um, we, you know, maybe um, uh, uh, General Counsel Grossman would want to address the um, escrow issue, but um, that issue has been brought up numerous times to um, the uh, commission through different lawyers, through different executive directors. And um, so far the commission has said that um, they were not going to um, ask for that for various reasons. And, and commissioner chairman, I'm sorry if I may just real quick, you know, uh, I'd like to highlight under 205 CMR 149, right? Criteria, permanently discontinue harness races or horse races to close a racetrack used for harness or horse races, to abandon or relinquish a license, to not apply for renewal of a license, or to transfer a racetrack to any entity. And then it goes on to say that the commission, the commission pursuant to any event as described above, has occurred or will occur, may take one or more of the following actions. And just that, hold a public hearing to determine if the money should be escrowed. I think we meet those obligations and why I keep pushing in the sent letter after letter. And I still think this horse racing committee, again, I know what the statute says, but I don't think we should be strictly bound by that, right? Our job is to promote, develop, protect the best interests of the Commonwealth. It even goes on to say the interest of the Commonwealth, employees of the Commonwealth. And then I do find, and again, while not an attorney, and I've, I've leaned on, on um, Council Grossman for this, very, at the very last end of one of the sections, it goes on to say that the HRC may make the recommendation to the Gaming Commission what to do with, with the portions, all or portions of the fund of that racehorse development fund that's in that escrow account. So, uh, again, interpretation. I know a lot of these are, are sometimes um, misinterpreted, convoluted the way they were written, but um, I would like for us at least to maybe pursue this further as a committee to see what can or can't be done for us to even at least make a recommendation to the MGC to escrow that money. Thank you, Mr. Merle. Attorney Grossman, yep. did you add anything to that? No, I, I don't have too much to add there. I, we are aware of the issue. The money has been set aside. Um, I, I get the argument. Uh, it's really up to the commission, uh, not this committee necessarily, but um, it's something that can be explored in the future, I suppose, though it's not really on the agenda for discussion today. But, um, you know, it's, it's an issue that we are aware of. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Attorney Goldberg, I'll turn the floor over to you then in terms of any questions or do you want to start your, your presentation? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I'll, I'll make a, a short presentation. Um, a lot of the stuff you've heard from me before, but then I'll, I'll certainly take any questions. You know, this committee has done a lot of hard work over the past nine plus years to, to uphold the ideas and ideals of the mass gaming statute. Um, many, many hours have been spent pouring over reports, documents, numbers after numbers after numbers. Um, what we have to look at and what's important is we've always looked back at the numbers. The landscape of horse racing in Massachusetts has trained, changed dramatically over the last few years and especially in the past two years. And I think we have, a, we have an obligation of doing the hard work, and this is hard work, uh, in determining the applicable split percentages uh, regarding the RHDF to, to bolster the horse racing industry in Massachusetts. And when I say the horse racing industry, I mean just that, the horse racing industry. Not standard reds, not thorough reds, but, but the horse racing industry. But both of them are equally as important to the Commonwealth, equally as important to saving jobs, to creating jobs, to saving open space, to helping all the uh, 
uh, farriers, veterinarians, feed dealers, grain dealers, all that's that's gone on for, for many, many, many decades, uh, centuries in Massachusetts. Um, if the dollars are not properly allocated in a way that promotes horse racing in Massachusetts, uh, allowing for the economic growth, the agribusiness growth, um, we run the risk of legislation changing to taking some of that uh, and reallocating quite honestly, funds away from the RHDF by the legislature, and why wouldn't they? Um, the standard bread industry feels uh, very strongly that this, the RHDF is doing exactly, precisely what the statute had intended, and the benefits to the Commonwealth are overwhelming. Um, you know, last year, uh, General Counsel Grossman suggested, and we discussed and uh, debated the reallocation of, of our uh, work into these three buckets. Um, it, it was a wonderful idea. We all agreed to it. We did that. And I think now it, it truly shows uh, the, the foresight of this committee, and starting with Attorney Grossman, uh, to be able to put us in a place where we can do, as a committee, can do just that. We can allocate the RHDF funds to help everybody to help parts of the thoroughbred owners and breeders trainers that were, have been getting funds over the years with the health and welfare to continue to help standard bred owners trainers breeders and everyone else and that's that's important the racing days the metrics are important commissioner cameron asked you know how do you come up with 92 percent it's a big number quite honestly I was prepared and I'm prepared to come in and request 100% of the purse bucket, of the purse bucket. If you look at 2019 and, and I'm always asked, how has it changed? How has it changed? Yes, and that's important. It's an important inquiry. If you look at 2019 to 2020, uh, the change is dramatic. When there's no racing, you know, 2019 there was six days of thoroughbred racing and 108 for the standard breads. Now we're going from zero to 68. And I'll get to the 68, the COVID, the pandemic reduced race meat uh, and why the rel for the relative needs, the purse money, the 92% is needed, is needed this year by the standard breads. And I'll get to that in a second. The metrics have changed dramatically. I mean, if you look at the number of occupational licenses it, in, 29, in 2019, it was 849 for the thoroughbreds, eight, 974 for the standard breads, almost equal. 2020, zero for the thoroughbreds, 900 for the standard breads. Qu quite a big discrepancy there. And those numbers up and down the, the, the 2020 charts are, are all the same. As far as the industries working together, there ha I can tell you right now there has been zero. There's been no backdoor deal done by anybody none zero and, and i'm a little insulted by even the insinuation that that's possible from day one starting in 2012 john sherman dr kochevar stephen riley everyone every leader of our group and the committee members have said why can't you guys talk and try to resolve some of these issues and we've tried, by the way. There were meetings in my office in 2012. There's been meetings. I went to Boston to meet with members in you know, 2007. We've tried. This is the first time. And, and my hat's off to Paul Umbrello, because I, I think he has done the best job of any representative. And I know people are probably chuckling. Well, that's because he's agreeing to give you 92%. No, that's not the reason. It's really not the reason. Um, I think we're entitled to 100% of the purse bucket. But Mr. Umbrella and I sat down for hours. We, we went over different things, the numbers, the effects, the past, the effects in the future. And I think that what we've come up with as a, no one, I don't think anyone, I don't think Mr. Umbrella or myself has ever intimated that just because we agree on something, the committee has to follow it. I don't know, and I apologize if anyone got that idea from anything I presented, because that's never the case. I, I, clearly, there needs to be a vote, and it has to be a majority. 
but we must follow the law as a committee. We must follow the law. There's been some thoroughbred people saying that Mr. Umbrella doesn't have the right to do this. Uh, when I read the laws, when I read the statutes, the NEHBPA and the Mass Thoroughbred Breeders, those are the two industries, uh, the, the two entities that have the right that to bind the thoroughbred industry in Massachusetts. So as a committee, we have to give Mr. Umbrello his uh, props and we have to listen to him and we have to uh, take his, his uh, word for things. Uh, that's important. In the same way with uh, the standard industry, the HHA and E and the a SOM are the two entities that are by statute designated to be the, th uh, the standard bread representatives. So I think the recommendation of the two industries uh, is important. You know, and Mr. Umbrella was asking about the 92 and 8. I mean, you know, we could crunch numbers for hours. I'm not going to bore everybody with that. But in, in 2020, going right to the purse bucket, in 2020, the standard breads were able to give out $101,000 a day in purses. And that was terrific. We were able to do that because it was only 68 days. So, you know, I, I guess the good news, bad news of the pandemic, although it's been a horrific event for everyone um, and reduced our racing to 68 days, we're able to provide $101,000 a day for purses. And that helped keep the uh, quality of the racing up. It helped bring in outside investment. And, and that's what we're trying to do. Keep the jobs for Massachusetts residents, Massachusetts farmers, horsemen and horsewomen, and also to bring in the guys and women from, from Maine and Delaware and New York to try to spend more of their time and money in Massachusetts. Um, but now going forward, God willing, there's no further pandemic issues and, and the standard is race, going back to their over 100 days of racing and 100 to keep, just to keep us at the same level in 2021, as we offered in 2020, we will need about $11 million in purses, $11 million. If the RHDF brings in a total of $12 million this year, at 92%, the standard budget will only get 8,832,000. If it goes to 50, if it's 15 million in total RHDF revenues, then they would be just just about $11 million going to the standard reds at the 92% number. This number wasn't just picked out of thin air. It was based on the metrics. So in order for the standard reds just to give out on a daily basis the same first level, we need that 92%. And that's important. It's important to keep the upward trend alive to keep people saying, oh, the it, it, Commonwealth of Massachusetts is doing everything possible to keep horse racing going in the right direction in Massachusetts. So that 92%, while it sounds like a big number, um, it's going to keep us at the level where we were last year. Um, and it's a very important number. As far as the um, uh, the, breed, the breeders, you know, we, we, quite honestly, we wanted more than 75% for the breeding, a lot more than 75%. I mean, I, and I'm not going to make the argument now because that's not what I'm here to do. But suffice it to say, as part of this, as part of the, the negotiations that Mr. Umbrella and I talking, there was give and take. This wasn't, this was far from a one-sided deal. Um, what the thoroughbreds got was a very healthy, amount of money going into the bucket of breeding and a very healthy amount of mo money going to the health and welfare bucket because we understand the health and welfare that Mr. Umbrello does have obligations that he needs to uh, honor. And this agreement that we've come up with that we're hoping that the committee will see that it, it wasn't a backdoor deal. It, it wasn't done with, we didn't pick numbers you know, out of thin air that it was done to look at each industry and look at each bucket and figure out 
what's the best way to allocate those funds so that each person in each bucket can get the most benefit out of it. And uh, that's what we've done. And I, and, I, and I really truly hope that this committee um, gets all their questions answered and ask the questions because uh, we're happy to answer them. And uh, I hope you two will, will see that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a very good uh, recommended split. And I hope you'd agree with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Attorney Goldberg. Uh, with respect to members of the committee, do any of the committee members have any questions for Attorney Goldberg? I do, Mr. Fitzgerald. Okay. Um, just a, a couple of, actually some, some clarity, which is very helpful to me. Uh, again, another um, very good discussion and explanation as to what transpires, which frankly, we did not have the benefit of the last meeting. Um, I, I don't think anyone on this committee uh, ever mentioned the words backroom deals. I think, and I'll speak for myself, I was just concerned that I didn't have information. You two got together, we did not have information as to what transpired. And I think for this committee to do its work properly, we needed to hear uh, what we heard today, which actually is much more that was, than was uh, contained in your briefs that you submitted. The same information was not in the written documents, which uh, I, I would have loved it to have been, frankly, because that would have been really helpful to me in understanding how you all uh, went about coming up with some uh, discussions or some, some numbers. That was helpful today to hear that. Um, my second concern is, um, you know, I, I was certainly concerned about the change in philosophy. Uh, they fought so hard and, and frankly, um, it was persuasive to me over the years to maintain money, to, to, um, to obtain, uh, to really attract investors for a new track. Also, some of the supporting documents what we received um, spoke about, um, there, there were allegations made, which you know what, you, you need to look at things for what they are. On both sides, in standard bread and in thoroughbred racing, we as the, as the commission and we as the committee have gotten lots of public comments about things that those folks don't agree with that the board may have been doing. And our answer has always been, hey, if you don't like the elected boards, then elect some people who you think will represent you properly. And I think the one thing I would like to ask at this point of Mr. Umbrella is the, is the, um, the statement that there has been no election on your board since 2014. Because again, we have told people, please, just if you don't like the way you're being represented, then you go about changing the board. Um, and I just, I don't know if that's accurate. I haven't uh, heard anything, but I thought I'd ask the direct question. No, thank you, Commissioner Cameron. And, and <clears throat> I will make one statement back that between yourself or the racing director, um, Director Lightbaum, um, I do find it kind of, um, I'm going to say it, offensive when I, when I hear these false allegations. And I would like or expect even in Alex herself to please call me. Um, I know Councilor Grossman's called me on one other issue. Um, all false information. We held an election in 2019. We held an election in 2020, and we will be holding an election and continuing in 2021. Thank the you, Mr. Bro. I just didn't have a. Rec I just. I'm asking. Oh. I'm not making. A, I am in no way making an allegation. I am asking a direct question because I think it's important for us to do our work. That all the documents that we received. Um, we can make sure we all have good information. So I thank you for that, and uh, that is that's important information. The other, um, the, the other last thing that was mentioned is that this committee has not in any way been concerned or interested in the two proposals out there, um, which which are there's one in Sturbridge and one in Wareham. So. If just for the, the committee's sake, um, Dr. Lightbaum, if you could talk about the work that you and the team has done um, uh, along the lines of working with both groups in, in, uh, for technical support. 
Sure, thank you, Commissioner. Um, both of these groups um, have approached me and they've met with myself and Attorney Grossman um, numerous times and um, are uh, feel free to give us phone calls with questions they may have about um, process, about our regulations, um, anything that we may be able to help on a technical side. Um, and we've been doing this all along um, as different groups have come forward through the years um, with different proposals. Um, once the proposals get to, uh, you know, oftentimes people come at a very early stage in a proposal and um, maybe it's not um, filled out that much or maybe the group um, wants to do more work before it would be ready to be um, brought to Commissioner Cameron um, or <clears throat> um, Executive uh, Director uh, Karen Wells. Um, both of these groups have now met with um, uh, the four of us um, to discuss their proposals. Um, and at some point, um, if they get to a point where they um, are further along in the process, um, we'll certainly be willing to arrange um, two by twos with our commissioners if the commissioners are um, so inclined um, to, to get the information. So um, we're very supportive of um, any groups that wanna come forward. Um, there's a lot of moving parts, as I'm sure um, everybody's aware. Um, a lot of different um, factors that come into it, uh, things in the general location, um, the city or town that they're doing, building permits, that kind of things, um, different um, committees that they might have to go for in front of in the um, towns, um, and then um, dealing with our legislation. I know, um, again, General Counsel Grossman has met um, and to express uh, different um, opinions on the way our um, statute works. We've talked to them about uh, how you apply for a license and that whole thing. Um, and it does come up occasionally at our commission meetings just in general passing that um, there are groups out there. Um, when, if we're asked to comment on legislation, you know, we usually uh, try to mention that there are groups out there. Um, and the groups themselves, um, they, uh, obviously they're the ones that are going to go to the press and make their announcements as to um, where they're at on that. And both of these groups have um, gone to the press. So that's all out there in, in, as a common knowledge right now. That these groups are working on it. Thank you. Mr. Thank Mr. You. Mr. Mr. You, Chairman, if I, if I may just please, um, I'll, let you, I'll let you address the first comment that Commissioner Cameron made. Um, for clarification, please. Yes, um, I want this publicly stated that I, I in no way, and I don't think either the thoroughbreds in any way uh, claim that this committee or anyone in this committee termed or called what we did a back a backdoor deal. That that wasn't my intent to say that. It, it's been written in other uh, some writings that have come into the to the to the to the committee. So that language. I do not believe was ever used by anyone in this committee. So that's, that's not an issue um, whatsoever. And if that was in any way intimated in what I've stated, uh, I apologize. Um, this, the, and the last comment or, or statement is the, the other thing that we, we've talked about um, making this, uh, any suggested split effective April 1st of 2021. And we've talked about the, the timing and why that's all important as racing uh, we'll start, God willing, in April for the standard breads. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there, there any other questions for uh, either Mr. Goldberg or Mr. Umbrello, I, the members at this time? So not so much a question from my end, but just to echo Commissioner Cameron's sentiments, I really appreciate the thorough explanation, um, particularly on the 92% number, because um, we're used to seeing round numbers, so it was really helpful to kind of understand exactly how you did get to that um, calculation. And so not so much a question, but um, wanting to sort of pull out the point that if we are to shift, you know, more dramatically um, this time around, um, a point for consideration, that that really is going to be marking a new precedent. Um, and so I do think that we should, you know, put some careful consideration into that. And I guess to you, Attorney Goldberg, um, 
a recognition that you feel comfortable with that moving forward, you know, if a new site were to, you know, get up and running and thoroughbreds were to be racing a dramatic number of new days, having that shift sort of, that, that pendulum sort of swing back in a similar manner. Thank you. Yeah. So Paul Umbrello and I have had this, we had that, we had this conversation this morning. And it was not the first time we had this conversation. We, we've had it many, many times over many, many months. Um, and yeah, I think it's this committee's charge under the law to, to be fair and to look at the metrics. And, and I think Commissioner Cameron was a thousand percent right. And in retrospect, um, it, it was very good that we came here today with the metrics, with the numbers, discuss them, answer the questions, because that is our charge, right? It's to look 23K, Section 60B, tells us what, how to do our job, basically, right? To look at the, all the, uh, the metrics, to compare them year to year, and come up with a fair and reasonable split. And I think that was done this year. And Attorney Katonic, I think, uh, I know, it'll be done next year, and the year after, and the year after. Um, and I, and Mr. Umbrella has my word that as long as I'm on uh, this, this committee, um, that's how I operate. It, it, it's, it's, yes, I'm a representative of the standard breads, but I think we're all representatives of the Commonwealth and the horse racing industry, and we have a duty to, to be fair and reasonable. So I don't see any issue, any problem with that going forward. Thank you. Uh, and if I may, Jim, so, I'm sorry, can I ahead, add, add to that? So that was the other premise again, and again, trying to save <laughs> legal expenses or whatnot, right? Again, looking at the past, looking at today, looking at the future. Again, historically, while that purse bucket seems like a, a significant jump, right? Even if based on all the criteria we that was submitted, there would probably be a minimum of a 5% five or 10 percent change on that bucket for 2020 right and we would probably be you know i'm just trying to let this committee understand some of the rationale behind it and um and then probably looking at 2021 when we start in the fall and again unless there's some drastic change which you know trying to forecast right now i don't see that other than revenue numbers coming in right assumptions were made that another five or ten percent would hit that purse bucket so i would expect looking at the fall of, of you know a year from now us coming back saying no change to all three buckets right stability long term that that helps everybody so that was another kind of part of the criteria and coming up with that sooner than sooner than later and then the other thing to think about is if we didn't um as a committee technically something food for thought break out these buckets, right? Where would we be at now probably looking at, unfortunately, you know, at the top, uh, 75, 25, making adjustments off the top. We'd probably be at a 80, 20, 90, 10 split, somewhere around there if I had to speculate. I'll say it's speculation. Well, guess what? That number, when you start breaking it out uh, on the first bucket, you're probably very close to the 8% you're looking at today the way we're doing it. If you start running you know, just, just numbers out, right? You used, you know, 10 million and, it, and it's 20%, it's 2 million and then 80% of that, you know, um, it's like $1.6 million. Um, so uh, that was another factor I looked at. If this committee rightfully so didn't break out each bucket, it would probably almost be, you'd be hurting more the breeding and health and welfare program. Um, but the purse bucket itself would probably relatively be, remain the same or not too far off even though that number does seem, it's just that. I get it. It seems very alarming going from, you know, the 70s to the 90s. But when you really break down the numbers and start looking at it, um, as we talked about, as, as Attorney Goldberg had said, it was just a lot of um, back and forth, extensive hours looking at the numbers, not only the criteria, but just the benefit to, to and the relative needs, as we always say, to um, each program. Thank you. Uh, I, Mr. Fitzgerald, did you want to, yep. I'm sorry, oh. Attorney Chairman Fitzgerald, did you want to make a comment? Because I, I had something to add, but I'll wait for you, sir. 
Um, well, I had another, just, I actually had a separate issue that I wanted to discuss with both industries. So I'll, I'll defer to your, your direct question. No. Uh, why don't you do that first? Cause then I percentages. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Um, for both industries, I, I just had a question just about in terms of, you know, there, in 2015, there was a law that changed where there was auditing of the actual um, of the fund and the allocations that were made to each industry. It was changed at that time to then allow for the um, uh, for the auditor, the state auditor, to be able to request um, that audit reports be submitted. Uh, and so I guess I just would ask, you know, it's been since essentially since 2015 that, that um, you know, the allocations of the funds have actually been audited by both industries. So I just wanted to, for purposes of just kind of generating a discussion between the two industries, you know, between you, Mr. Goldberg and Mr. Umbrello, in terms of the appetite for seeing if uh, there's, you know, um, a willingness on each industry to have their funds audited, you know, based on the, 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 the prior year. As an example, I would say because of the fact that 2019 was pre-pandemic, um, whether there'd be uh, a, a willingness to kind of have the 2019 figures looked at. And I recognize that we don't have the statutory authority to order that. Um, maybe we have uh, some authority to make a recommendation of it. Um, but I just kind of wanted to generate the discussion to see if that's something that, uh, that you both would be uh, interested in doing so that there's more of a direct report. I know that we get the executive summaries to describe how these figures are actually used and the, the programs that they're used in. Um, but the additional component of having the audit is, is to say that, yes, this, the actual actual dollars and cents are being used in compliance with the statute. So, so I just kind of wanted to get your initial thoughts on that. So. Well, I'll, I'll speak, Jim, if it's show to answer that. Um, this is the first I've heard of, of that request or any question. I, I know nothing about audits either, either way. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine... Uh, certainly, if, if the Commonwealth has the authority to do it and request it, I think the standard, I know the standard of industry would comply fully. Um, and I don't see any um, reason why an audit would be uh, not welcomed by the standard Great. 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 Chairman Fitzgerald, I can, I can also say the same. I know the breeders have been at the same time, and actually, we're just finishing it up. I have presented to the Commission in the past. Uh, Director Lightbaum, our audits from 2015, 16, and 17, um, rightfully so, and I'm now working on 18, 19, and 20. So we do full we do full audits, you know, every three years according to our bylaws. But I do a um, interim audit, third party, um, and actually those are currently being worked on because they do take some time. Um, and the same thing, I've, I've submitted those in the past to Commissioner, sorry, to uh, Director Lightbaum, and same thing, would be willing to do the same or have our, our books audited. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, does anyone else have any other comments and questions before we kind of proceed? No? Okay. All right. Um, well, thank you both for the, to the thoroughbreds and the standard breads for your, your submissions and all the hard work that went in, went into them. Um, I guess in terms of what we've been presented, uh, by the, or to the committee at this time, uh, and in kind of keeping in, you know, consistent with how we, uh, changed our process last year and looking at each of the individual categories separately and taking a vote on uh, each of those categories. Um, uh, I'd like to ask the committee members if we'd like to proceed in that way and looking at each of these categories at this time. Yeah. Maybe, maybe if Chairman Fitzgerald, if you like, I'd be happy to make a motion regarding uh, the proposed split 
to all for all three categories and then maybe we could do i think that's i think that's what we did last time and then vote individually up or down on, on each on each bucket on each category is that I think what we did last time was we took each individual category and we took a vote separate motion, a separate motion for yeah, each sep separate motion. There were three separate motions. Okay. So, then so, um, I think I'd like to try and be consistent with that process. So sure. that's okay with me. So, okay. All right. No, uh, so well, why don't I, we just start with the health and welfare benefits category then? I, Mr. Chairman, I, I would, I would move then that, uh, that we, uh, I'd make a motion that we agree to reallocate the resource development fund split as it relates to the health and welfare portion of the resource development fund uh, to reallocate that split for 2021, effective April 1st of 2021 to 50% for the standard breads and 50% to the thoroughbreds. And is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? Yeah, I um, I actually thought that uh, both representatives um, made persuasive arguments about the needs of both organizations and the stability moving forward of having um, a number that they thought made sense. Uh, so I actually, uh, I think that I'm, I'm persuaded that that's a good number with health and welfare. Okay. Okay. All right. So the motion then carries. So I'm going to uh, take a roll call vote on the basis of, of the motion. Uh, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Attorney Katanek. Aye. Mr. Umbrello. Aye. Attorney Goldberg. Aye. And Fitzgerald, aye. Okay. All right. The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, we will move now to the discussion regarding the breeders uh, distribution. Um, and at this point in time, I didn't ask if there is a motion that is going to be tabled. Mr. Chairman, I, I, would, I would again move that, um, that we agree to reallocate the resource development fund split uh, as it pertains to the breeders allocation uh, to be 75% of that allocation to the standard breads and 25% of that allocation to the thoroughbred industry. I'll second that. Second. Okay. Motion moves forward. So, Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Attorney Katanak? Aye. Mr. Umbrello? Aye. Attorney Goldberg? Aye. And Fitzgerald? Aye. Thank you. The motion is approved. So, then we'll move on to the uh, purse allocation and is there a motion to be presented uh, based on the purse allocation the chairman i guess uh through the silence i will step up and make the next motion please uh, and i would move that the uh that we agree to reallocate the resource development fund split percentage as it pertains to the allocation to purses to the uh, change to be made to sit 92 percent of that allocation to the standard breads with 8% of the purse allocation to the thoroughbred industry. Is there a second for that motion? I will second it. Discussion, any, Mr. Chair? Yeah, any further discussion, yes. Uh, yeah, I would like to um, talk about the beginning of this committee work and how we had an expert report um, stating that 90% of the money should go to the thoroughbreds and 10% should go to the standard breads and um, how this committee did think about precedent, 
did think about uh, the needs of both breeds and um, we we chose not to use that report and we came up with a far different split and um, attorney Kutonik's comments about precedent did strike me as something that we should consider. And I think there were good rationale over the years why we were cautious and why we did maybe a 5% or a 10% increase. Um, I am still uncomfortable with the, the huge swing. Um, I, I, I've listened to the reasons for such, but I'm, I, I am not persuaded that that's the right number to go to. I do believe that there is a need uh, because of the drop in revenue for the standard bread to, to uh, have a bigger piece. I'd be prepared to go 10% up to the 80-20 that we talked about. Um, but I, I, am, I, am I am concerned about the work of this committee moving forward and that those huge splits uh, may not be a good idea. And I would not be as persuaded that we should be convinced in the future to go in a totally other direction also. It's very different than the work that we've done in the past. And I've been very comfortable with the decision that these, this committee has done in the past and um, in not going with huge splits. I understand circumstances are different, but I also have been persuaded in the past that and these are two very promising proposals. Um, and, you know, holding on to some of that purse money as an incentive has, has been what we've done for years, thinking that was a way to incentivize. So I, for one, am not comfortable um, with that large uh, a split. If, if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, the numbers are what we've always talked about. And as Commissioner Cameron states, um, the metrics are what we always looked at. And that's what the statute requires us to do. The difference, the change, I, I can't tell you, committee members, the public, what my discussions were with uh, settlement agreement, whatever you want to call them, discussions were with the thoroughbreds in prior years. But I can tell you that this move towards no racing is significant. Unfortunately, the relative needs of these industries, it's clear. We're charged by law to do what's right for the Commonwealth. The thoroughbreds, the standard breds need this money to keep their purses the same level they were in 2020. If we don't get it, the purse levels will decrease. Just the way it's going to be. We need to keep it at that level. The thoroughbreds are not, have not raced in 2020. Unfortunately, they're not racing in 2021. That's a significant change. You know, in 2012, yeah, we got a report from, a, from a, an expert, but we, we didn't follow it also because there were many, 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 many errors that we found in that report. But in 2013, 2012, the standard breds were racing over 100 days a year. The thoroughbreds racing 60, and we got 25%. That's it. You know, that was, that's a huge number that, that the standard breads really got hit with. It's been a small move every year to get it where it needs to be, where it needed to be, and we're not there yet. We're truly not there yet. The 92%. Is it bigger than 70? Well, of course it is. But the numbers, as Paul Umbrello suggested, the numbers aren't that big. And depending on what happens with the Racehorse Development Fund this year and the, the income from the casinos, um, it may, may be even smaller. But I know this. The standard bridge need that 92% to keep that arrow pointing upwards to keep the people coming in from other states, to keep the Massachusetts residents who, who, have, who have put money into their farms, which is what the statute intended, who have put money into their houses, which is what the statute intended, who have put money into their racing stock, into the horses. The quality has increased dramatically. 
Those are all wonderful things. By making it 92%, this isn't going to be a pot of gold for the standard bids. This is going to enable us to keep the daily racing levels where they were last year. I've suggested, I've said it, I said it, I've said it at this committee, I said it to Mr. Umbrello privately many times. What next year brings, next year brings, or the year after, we, we'll look at it. And, and we'll make the, I think as the committee will make the appropriate change. But it, this is not as drastic a change as it seems. And I think it's truly necessary to show the Commonwealth, to show the legislature, to show everyone that this is a statute that's working. It's working in Massachusetts. Let's not slow it down. Let's not try to break it. I think the 92%, I know the 92%, is a good number. And it's a number that, quite honestly, is why we agreed to 75, 25 for the breeders. And I don't want to go back. And unfortunately, you know, if we started with, if we started with the first bucket and it was something less than 92, I wouldn't agree to 75% for the breeders. We have 122 broodmares to two for the thoroughbreds. And I don't, want, I don't want to come arguing that today. That's not what we're here for. But this truly was thought of by myself as a three-bucket allocation. Anything less than 92%, I think, is a mistake. I think it would be really difficult for the standard breads to, to move forward. And it, it's not what the intent was of uh, what come my, myself, at least, coming to this meeting. It, the 92, 75, 50, 50, um, I feel clearly takes into consideration the health and welfare, the breeding, and the day-to-day -day overnight races. And I think that if we're going to go to 50, 50 and 75, 25, the 92, 8 split makes all the sense in the world. And I would, I would implore this committee to see that and to vote yes on this motion mr chairman if i could add to that right and again it's <laughs> for us looking at criteria again the the painstaking hours again attorney goldberg especially myself put into this was it comes down just that to numbers so so maybe it'll help this committee to understand that you know with covid using 10 million as a base i'm already forecasting i don't even think which i i do hope we hit 15 million um, in revenue from the casinos looking at January and February. I think we're on target for 15, but again, that's if, if we stay on course. But for perspective and looking at 2020, and I know we're moving forward looking at 2021, but an 80-20 an split today in the purse bucket would equate to, on the thoroughbred side, 1.6 million in revenue. 85, I'm sorry, 85-15, would equate to 1.2, about a $400,000 difference. And a 90-10 split even is about 800,000. So while, while the shift in percentage seems excessive, it, it's about $800,000 of, of revenue coming in based on COVID numbers, maybe a little more if the numbers get better, right? But uh, again, I don't have the crystal ball. So you, so you gotta use, you know, <laughs> looking back and then trying to look ahead and forecast. So, um, Again, I think perception is looking at an adjustment seems that alarming, but by breaking out the buckets does again help each program. But um, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to say 800,000 is not a lot in the thoroughbred industry. Again, uh, that's not a significant amount of race days. Again, escrowing the 20 million is a significant amount of race days. So even if we did 80, 20 this year today, and we come back here a year from now, right? And we make another five or 10% split, and again, trying to forecast, uh, I think we're going to be in no different of a position. I think this committee still would be at a 85, 15, 90, 10 split on the purse bucket. Uh, that was that was some of the uh, rationale that that you know I, I in in talking to others put in behind this of how we came up with that number again. It's a, maybe it's important to understand that. And, and Mr. Chairman, you talk about the audit. And I heard you say that you'd like to see how each industry spends their money from the racehorse development fund. 
precisely. I can tell you this right now. Any percentage that we give to the thoroughbreds for 2021 will not get spent. We don't need a CPA or auditor to tell us that. It wasn't spent last year. Zero dollars was spent last year. Zero dollars will be spent in 2021. That's unfortunate, but that's the truth. Every dollar of purse money that's given to the Standard Bridge this year will be spent. I think that's significant. I think that the, the, the Commonwealth deserves that, that the money be used to take care of what the statute intended. And the Standard Bridge will use every dollar. And whatever, whether it's 800,000 or a million two of, of purse money that the thoroughbreds get this year, uh, based on their 8%, it's going to go into that 20 million, just make that balance higher and higher. I mean, it will not be used this year. And that's not what the statute intended. The, the 92% is a fair number. It's a, a number that both industries have gone back and forth for hours talking about. It's a number we agreed to. And it's also a number that then led to the 75-25 and 50-50 numbers as well. They're, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. There was a uh, lots of discussion about all three numbers. I think that's important to note as well. Thank you, Mr. Roller. So, uh, Attorney um, Katunuk, did you want to comment? Yeah, so I think, I mean, this is a bigger shift um, than we have seen traditionally. And that is something that did, you know, give me pause. Um, but I will say that I, I'm finding myself being persuaded by your discussion of the really dramatic shift that's taken place in the industry as well, both in terms of racing days and in terms of the revenue that's available um, for the respective industries this year. I think those two combined, um, you know, make a more compelling case for um, a more outsized shift than what we've considered in the past. And I guess this is just a question in terms of historical allocation, and maybe it's for Dr. Lightbaum, but have we, in the history of the fund, have we allocated purse money to an industry that has had no racing days? Uh, no, the, well, the money, um for um, the thoroughbreds, they this is the first time there has been no racing days, was last year to begin with. So no, there hasn't. Um, the money that um, the thoroughbreds could have used if they had had a full meet, but didn't use, that has gone to the, um, that stayed in the fund so that it's there still. Right, so in terms of the look back, if we were to allocate funds to, purse funds to the thoroughbreds, this would mark the first time that we'd be allocating funds to an industry that has had no racing days in the prior year. Uh, yes. Which I think is also an important precedent to consider. But, but if I may interrupt, I'm sorry, but technically, which the horseman chose not to, and it, it would have been excessive, but we could have made the request even during the festivals to literally request every single penny of that race was development fund. <laughs> um, I will admit it, not sure how far it would have, would have went. Other states have done it, Kentucky Downs does it. They literally put on, you know, like a Saratoga meet, excessive meet. We could have asked for excessive amounts of that purse money to use over the festivals over the last six years. But again, the intent was just that, save it for the rainy day, save it for the investors, save it to kickstart the building of a, of a, a new racetrack. Unfortunately, the hurdle is it's it's sitting in limbo. And we need to protect that money again. That's 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 really the, the again. I'm going to emphasize the most important part of this. And I still think we should have a follow up meeting after we vote today with this committee to see if there's anything we should do as again the committee to promote, develop, and support the relative needs of that money. I, I still think it's it's our duty to make the recommendation to the commission. Thank you, Mr. Umbrello. Uh, Commissioner Cameron, did you have any? Well, I am. I am um, thinking about it differently as a you know with no race days. So so it's it's really not a precedent because 
the facts have changed so much. I guess I wasn't considering that piece of it. Just, you know, I was really considering the work in the past of this committee, how we were cautious for a reason and um, trying to be fair to both breeds. Um, and I'll remember those early, as Mr. Goldberg will as well, he was with us early on, you know, those passionate discussions about the standard bread, you know, having more of the monies come to them. And th those discussions were persuasive to me, as were the thoroughbred, um, uh, you know, discussions over the last couple of years, where frankly, the metrics didn't actually work out. Um, you know, we didn't go exactly by metrics because we should be considering other factors. And that, um, that need to attract a group was persuasive to me that would come in here to the Commonwealth and build a new racetrack. And I am, I am optimistic with the projects now that I hear about. And um, so, so I, but, but I guess if, if we are looking at, as um, Attorney Kaponik just mentioned, the fact that there are no racing days and how does that change our thinking, it is a factor that, that I need to consider. Okay. All right. So we have, uh, are there any, any other comments from any of the other committee members at this time? We have a motion that's been presented uh, and that motion has been seconded. Um, we'll proceed to a, a full vote at this time. Okay. Uh, the motion as presented, Commissioner Cameron? I'll vote aye. Attorney Katanak? Aye. Mr. Umbrella? Aye. Attorney Goldberg? Aye. And Fitzgerald? Aye. So the motion is approved. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, for all of your hard work uh, and moving this forward. Uh, at this time, kind of looking at our agenda, I just wanted to talk about um, the next steps and, and either uh, any future meeting dates that we do want to schedule. Uh, do we want to uh, now be able to uh, look at potentially scheduling something in the late fall? for a meeting like we did last year, I believe we had a meeting in October. Uh, and I was wondering if we wanted to schedule something around then or in November at this time. Well, I'm hoping I just get through this month, never mind October, but that's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and, and can I, Chairman Fitzgerald, I'm sorry though. Can, can I at least table again if, and Council Grossman, please, is do we have, I guess, this committee have the authority, this is what I'm trying to learn, uh, um, have the authority to at least review 205 CMR 149 and put our own opinion of that interpretation of it and still present a recommendation to the commission? Like, what, why, why would we not be able to at least do that? I mean, we've made um special allocations toward the split we do make a recommendation on the split um you know as you and i talk about it's always interpretation when you read it um i don't know if it's beneficial for this committee to literally just review 205 cmr 149 or a subcommittee um or it's a mute point and and just see that if it's something that we should pursue and by the way for this committee to understand that it's also benefit for the instead of that money becoming dangling like a carrot in a money grab. But I know it's, it's during COVID, but rightfully so, again, the law states escrow the, the, the funding. I don't think we would, well, I suppose we wouldn't see any or get any objections towards it. I'm sure the investors themselves would be all over as they've done in the past sending letters of recommendation to escrow. Um, but do we owe it to ourselves, again, as this committee to, to review that and get a better understanding and interpretation of, of that law. So is the, the, the question to have uh, an overview uh, of uh, 
205 CMR section 149 dealing with the yep. issue of the escrow of the funds? Yep. And kind of a, um, a legal opinion on that matter? I, I don't know if Todd's going to say that's a, Councilor Grossman, that's a gray area, but I, I, I call a legal opinion. Again, well, the HRC committee, I think we should review it and just have an opinion of it, right? And then make a recommendation to the Gaming Commission. They can choose what they want to do with it, but I think, you know, uh, myself, others, over the years, we've continuously sent letters um, to the MGC, and, and I understand at times the sensitivity behind it. But it's also important, right? What's our mission statement for both the MGC and the HRC? Again, promote, support the relative needs. And by the way, if we escrow this funding again and for three years, and for whatever reasons, hopefully not, the thoroughbred industry goes belly up, you now have the authority also to then, that's in CMR 205-149, transfer that funding to the Standard Bread Association. Um, so again, I think it's important to the industry, just that. I can't emphasize enough. I think you've heard it in nauseam to escrow that money. I'm just trying to figure out, again, interpretation for this committee. Do we have um, any oversight, any authority to at least um, provide our own opinion to the commission? I think that might have more merit, more weight. And from stepping, you know, I, I don't know if I'm stepping out of bounds, out of territory. I just think it's it's important that we should at least this committee should at least review it. Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I may, and I, and Commissioner Cameron will, I, I think I remember if it's if it's probably much better than mine anyway. Uh, yeah. Back when we made our first recommendation to the gaming uh, to the legislature and gaming commission, it was a time when the standard bread industry was in dire straits regarding potential of not racing and we actually if you look turn back and look at the and the first recommendation I think November of 13 I think it was or to the Commission we we put in something about escrowing funds if one if one breed fails to race just for that just for that purpose so that if and if it went I think we mentioned the three years and if, if they don't if they don't race for three years, then it can be reallocated. So um, I think we would be in support of any kind of discussion going forward that we as a committee can have to help uh, flesh out, if you will, what the best way to deal with this surplus or, or the, the, the money that's currently in, I don't want to call it surplus, but the unspent funds in the RHDF, I think, need to be protected for the horse racing industry in Massachusetts. So Attorney Goldberg, it's your recollection that there was a recommendation within one of our opinions? Yes, Commissioner. Yeah, I, I don't, I'd have to see it. I don't, I don't recall that. And I, I think I probably have yeah. to recuse this. I, I mean, I, I think one of the reasons we just talked about our authority was I don't think escrow is part of our authority. I think any recommendation can be made though, but because I am a member of the gaming commission, um, I, I would not want to um, uh, be making a recommendation to the body. You know, I, I sit with the Gaming Commission, so I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to recuse from this discussion as it may be a matter that I will have to opine on later. And by the way, the commission, I think the committee knows that this was brought before the committee, or rather the commission, and, um, and um, for legal reasons, the um, the, com the makeup of the committee at that commission at that time decided that it wouldn't be appropriate to escrow that money. Now, there is a new, um, there are new members of, of the commission and certainly um, the thoroughbred horsemen have the ability to bring it before the commission if they see it as an issue um, that they'd like to see revisited. So yeah, Commissioner so Cameron, all, all I'm getting at, I'm sorry, is that I myself, uh, the any HBPA mass breeders can make that letter of recommendation. I, I just don't know. Again, I'm, I'm not saying this committee has to make the recommendation. I'm just saying is does this committee 
I think have the authority and has more more weight behind it so that instead of myself, maybe the Wareham group, the Sturbridge group, all sending letters, including the standard breads, I don't know if there's any merit to this committee as well to do some form of analysis and see if they come to the same conclusion that, yes, they feel based on reading 205 CMR 149, they can make the recommendation to the commission that they see that money could could be escrowed. So now it's now it's you know it's it's the HRC, it's the thoroughbred industry, the standard bread industry, and racetrack investors. Now I'll I'll which rightfully so and importantly rallying to to escrow that money. That that's all kind of my ask was is I don't know and I guess what I'm trying to get from from Council Grossman or Chair Fitzgerald is just that why wouldn't we as a committee just you know depending on what the outcome is. I see two two parts to to the concern. One is is one is the the, the statutory authority of the, the the committee to even make a recommendation, and then the statutory authority of the commission to decide what can be done with those those funds. So I see it as a two part kind of discussion, and I guess for purposes of the committee, whether the members want to uh, address, the, address the issue as to whether or not they can even make a, a recommendation, so. Yeah, and I would, I would just jump in, Mr. Chair, and say for my part, I would, I would wanna look at that regulation again. I, I don't recall exactly what it says about that, um, but it's it's certainly not completely out of bounds that the committee would talk about it. I don't think there's anything yeah. wrong with that. I, I don't know what the outcome can or, or would be, of course. Okay, all right. So, Mr. Umbrello, just in terms of of you know any further discussion on it, am I kind of seeing the the same point that you are in terms of the, the, the two issues? Have I narrowed it down for purposes of uh, whether Attorney Grossman, um, you know, put together a memorandum to saying whether the committee has the statutory authority to either make a recommendation or not? And then is your further question related to overall what can be done with those, with that escrow? Uh, correct. I guess the thought, third point, um, Council Grossman, is is that does this committee have the right to review it and just have an opinion? Not what our, well, I guess that's kind of the same thing. What our statute, well, I'm crossing it over. What our statutory obligation is versus, hey, I'd like this committee just to review it and get an opinion whether they think, yep, yep, we have no oversight, no say, or um, as one, and then two to your two part, Chairman Fitzgerald is. Oh yes, we can do this, or yes, we can make the recommendation. Um, okay. I, I just think I'd like to have a, a follow-up meeting and have us just review and get get input from this committee on their their interpretation of that law, than just than just myself continuing to send letters on behalf of the breeders and the NEHBPA, or then leaving it up to one individual's interpretation of of the law. I guess. Right? Maybe does that's does that make sense? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Am I muddy in the waters? I apologize if I'm muddy in the waters because I know this is kind of again <laughs> we're trying to read what's black and white and interpret it, but I'm also looking at and I recognize this committee is just that it's a horse racing committee, so I just feel we have an obligation to you know review that and, 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 and file an opinion of it, right? Doesn't mean what we do with it or where we go with it. I'm just curious what the opinion of this committee is in their interpretation. Okay, All right. So does any other committee member have any, any comments regarding the request to look at? Do we want to have it as a discussion item at our next at our next meeting our next scheduled meeting 
No, Chairman Fitzgerald, that's my concern. I don't think this can wait, right? I, I think, and we don't know again with the crystal ball what the next three months are going to do. So I would like, a, you know, everybody to have the opportunity and time to review it, interpret it, and then we meet back sooner rather than later before the next meeting and just, you know, everybody, I guess, would give an, an opinion of their interpretation. Again, as, as, as long as we're going to need some some time for that to, to, to take place if, you know, based on if there needs to be a review of it. So, right. so I mean, and what I was know. thinking. Sorry. Uh, no, no, no. I just was thinking, I was just thinking at our next scheduled meeting, if it meant that we were meeting in October as we did last year, then we would have it as a discussion item at our next scheduled meeting. Yeah, just my personal opinion. We've talked about this year after year after year, the money grab, the money grab, the money grab. And, and yeah. rightfully so, again, the EPA and the mass breeders and their lobbyists, I'm going to give them all the credit. Um, they've been the ones doing their jobs be, between the House and the Senate, doing whatever we can to help try to protect that funding. But, you know, um, it doesn't mean it's always, it's always going to be there. So you reassure your investors, right? We worry about investors. I hear the comments. How do you reassure it? Escrow it. Um, just don't think the longer we wait, you know, the, the more vulnerable potentially that, that money becomes. Maybe it doesn't. I would just rather, as, as I feel it, it's me sitting on this committee now. It's our obligation, duty, whatnot, to see just that. What can we do, even for myself on the thoroughbred side, is to push to escrow that money and again, as we talk about, this isn't even as much as it's for the thoroughbred horsemen, but it's the racetrack investors to have, as we keep saying, that money available for them to start a meet when when it's needed. So, you know, I do admit this is new territory for myself in this committee and trying to understand what, what our boundaries are and what's not. I just think this is something, there's no reason why we just can't talk about it. It doesn't have to be, it shouldn't be just about the split. That's all. I'd like to do it sooner than later. Um, and, if I'm, and by the way, if I'm way off base, people, please, by all means, tell me that this is, you know, just that, out of our realm, out of scope. But I, I just feel a little differently about it, but that's just my opinion, right? I'm yeah, one of five. No, no, no. I, I, I want to be able to at least address your concern and, 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 and have a discussion when the discussion can be had based on the relevant information that can be obtained for yep. it. I guess I just was thinking you know, that, you know, this would be, it would be an appropriate time at that, uh, you know, at the next scheduled meeting to be able to have that as part of the overall discussion when we're kind of moving forward with the other plans for, for 2022. So. Um, yeah, I, again, I'm sorry, my opinion is that that's too far out. And I think I would like to keep this separate than the split keep the focus on just that, that, that funding and the escrowing of it. I don't know how this fail. That's just, again, my humble opinion. Okay. Are there any, are, do any of the other committee members have any comments or offer any uh, input? So I'm joined by my tiny consultant here, so apologies in advance. Um, but I think kind of thinking back to Attorney Grossman's overview of our purview here is really helpful for this discussion and that we're really just charged with looking at the split. And I think to the extent that whether the funds can or cannot be escrowed would impact our decision on you know, any split before us, then I do think that's a, a relevant discussion. So in my mind, I think the two go together and are not necessarily separate issues. Okay. Thank you. A anyone, anyone else? No? Okay. All right. So Mr. Umbrello, if we do address this at, at our next, at our next meeting, um, and, and make it a point of, of, of discussion at that time. Um, would that work? Would that work for you with this? Um, well, again, 
I'm going to be more vocal and say I think it's too far out, but if that's what this, um, how this committee feels, um, then I don't know if we should take a vote, then so be it, right? That's I'm only one of five, so I respect that. Okay. Just, Mr. Chairman, just to, uh, yeah. to add to the, to add to the fray, um, I hear what Mr. Umbrello is saying, and I, and I, and I agree with him. Um, maybe not so shocking anymore, but I agree with him. Um, I think he's, what he's requesting is maybe a, a meeting before November uh, to have a brief, I'll be a brief discussion or whatever we can, maybe gather some information prior to and have a discussion regarding the potentiality of making some type of rec recommendation regarding escrow of the fund. So I, I would be okay personally as one of five again to have a meeting, whether it's April, May, or as soon as this committee can for the limited purpose of discussing the escrow issue. Okay, all right. Um, then uh, I'll just quickly, Mr. Grossman, in terms of, do you think based on the discussion you have enough to kind of pinpoint the issue and, and draft a memorandum with that? Yes, I'm very familiar with this issue. So we can, we'll have it teed up. Um, I think that's perfectly appropriate um, as soon as possible. Maybe I can just coordinate with the chair as far as scheduling goes, uh, yeah. if that works for everyone, okay. if that's the inclination. Okay, all right. So then we'd be looking at some time, would, would maybe an appropriate time then to take a look for a quick meeting? I think that that sounds reasonable. That sounds reasonable, okay, all right. Mr. Umbrello? That's um, more than reasonable. I appreciate. Thank you, Chairman Fitzgerald. All right. Okay. All right. So um, we'd then be looking to, to kind of schedule a, a meeting sometime in May. Uh, do we want to look at, I know historically we've tried to do um, maybe Wednesdays. So uh, would sometime around May 19th work? May 19th works for, for me, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Works for me, that's fine, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right. That's good on my end too. Okay. Yeah, it works for me. I just need to check on my um, my ability to participate. Now I'll do that with, uh, with uh, Council Grossman at another time. Okay, all right, okay. So we'd be looking at maybe May 19th in the afternoon. Two o'clock. Would two o'clock work? Okay. That's fine. Okay, all right. So then we'll reconvene May 19th at, at uh, 2 p.m. Is there any further business that any of the members wish to address? Mr. Chair, not obviously not coming from a member here, but I, I just thought I would rem remind everyone as to the process for the approval of the recommendation from today. Um, yes. By statute, uh, we now will submit the uh, voted on recommendations to the legislature. Um, we need to wait 30 days and then we will present those to the commission for approval. Um, and if I understood the votes correctly, the uh, desire was to have the split, the new splits go into effect as of April 1. So that would yes. be what the recommendation is. I'll prepare the, the letter and circulate it to the group just so everyone can have a look before we send it out. And if you could all just let me know whether there's anything that needs to be adjusted, that'd be great. Otherwise, we'll try to get that out in the next day or so, just to get the Thank clock. you very much, Attorney Grossman. Thank My you, pleasure. Attorney Grossman. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hey, anything further? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion so, to adjourn. Second. Okay. <laughs> All right. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Attorney Katunak. Aye. Mr. Umbrello. Aye. Attorney Goldberg. Aye. And Fitzgerald, aye. Okay. All right. Well, thank you to all the committee members and thank you to all the uh, Gaming Commission staff, Attorney Grossman, Ms. Perez, thank you. Thank you so much for all your time and efforts. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye, <laughs> everybody.